seats, please. Everybody take your seats. The, we're about to start. Come on in. Come on, there are seats up at the front where some speakers have gone already. Come on in and find a seat. We've lost a bit of time already, so I'm anxious to get going. Thanks everybody for making it back at this after such a full day already. Um, and welcome to the debate, be it resolved, professional football is powerless to end racism. Um, I'm Sarah Llewellyn and I'm the Chief Executive of the Barrow Cadbury oh, Trust in the UK. Um, I think we can do without the music now, thanks guys. Um, and, and you might be wondering, as I certainly did myself, why I am ending up chairing a debate about what, what, what we call where I come from, which is Wales, soccer. And you had earlier on, you had, um, I know nothing about football, other than to say that my sons are Arsenal fans and they're quite pleased with Arsenal and Arsenal ladies' performance this year. Any Arsenal fans? Way! <laughs> and she's from Sarajevo. So, anyway, um, Uli was saying to you earlier when he introduced his session um, that, um, that he, had, he had was uh, moderating that session um, because otherwise the panel wouldn't be diverse enough. And, uh, well, Ratner, you said it. Um, I, I'm sure you couldn't find a woman to talk about football in the depth that these two can. Um, and the irony is that Uli said to me, I would love to moderate that session. I know a lot about football. And I said, well, it's funny you should say that because I know a lot about welcoming cities. <laughs> but anyway, we are where we are, and I'm not going to say anything about football, which will be a great relief to you given that we're running behind time. Um, where I come from, um, what, what most people call f football is called soccer, and it's traditionally, historically, only been for the under fives. It's a sort of nursery game and, until you're old enough to play proper football, which is, which is rugby football. Um, anyway, <laughs> anyway, I'm being told all around by various of the guys that I've talked to for a bit of inspiration over the past couple of days that I'm well out of date with all of that and that uh, Wales has actually produced what is currently the world's best footballer. I did actually know that because I do have sons. Um, and, that, and that he won the European Cup. So Wales won the European Cup this this year, yeah. So that's a bit, I thought that was quite interesting. And the, and the Welsh flag uh, was flying over uh, the, the Madrid derby. So, anyway, my first job is to tell you the results of the poll that some of you participated in earlier. I hope all of you did, but not all of you did, I've, but mostly. And... Um, be it resolved, professional football is powerless to end racism. Agree, 38%, and that's Sunda's argument. And disagree, 62 And the second question, so it's an optimistic audience, uh, depending on what you hear today, would you be open to changing your vote? And the yes to that was 66 and the no to that was 34. So I think there's a few fib tellers here today. Anyway, I'm going to go straight into the debate because we're, we, we are a little bit short of time. And I'm first of all going to, sorry, I'm going to, we've got to film first. Yeah, sorry. Thank you, Sundar.
Thank you very much. I'm going to introduce our debaters, uh, and then we'll move straight into the debate. On my left um, is Sunda Katwala, who is the director of British Future, a think tank in the UK uh, created to open a better public debate about migration, integration, British identity, and so on. Um, he used to run the Fabian Society in the UK. He's been a researcher, uh, a publisher. Um, he's a football fan. He's of uh, Irish and Indian heritage. And he recently, he told me, he took three of his very small children to the, uh, to the Ladies' Cup final that Arsenal ladies... Can I hear it for Arsenal again, please? <laughs> Arsenal ladies won. Um, and thank you. And, and, and Sunda, Sunda is going to... Um, uh, be the mover of the motion. And then we will move to David Goldblatt, who's the author of The Ball is Round, which I have to tell you where I come from, it isn't. <laughs> he's, a, he's an author, an academic. Um, he's made documentaries about football. Um, he knows more about football than, than, than I want to, I think. Um, <laughs> But he's very, very interesting on the subject, um, and he's he's giving us um, the 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 opposite uh, to the debate. So I'm going to start with Sunda. Ten minutes, Sunda. I'll give you the two-minute warning. Thank you. Th thanks very much. Thanks for um, inviting me. It's great to be here. Um, it was mostly football that introduced me to racism, and it was football that introduced me to anti-racism. Too. So I think the story of racism and football is bound to be a game of two halves today. <laughs> Let me tell you how that happened. Um, if you met my eight-year-old self, I was obsessed with football. I lived and breathed football. I mean, I've matured and grown up a lot, a lot now, as you can no. as you can tell. But uh, uh, my dad's game was cricket. He was a cricket obsessive. He came to Britain from India. I remember how shocked he was, how shocked everyone was when India won the Cricket World Cup against the West Indies when I was nine. But I, it was a, I think it was a subtle pro-integration act on my mum's part. She was from Cork in Ireland. That um, We were growing up about 20 miles from Liverpool in the northwest, and she thought that, you know, when I was four, I needed to know who Kevin Keegan was. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that, that worked, <laughs> that plan of hers. So by the time I was eight, I had the replica kit, uh, the, sh the shirt, the socks, the shorts. Yeah, I bought Shoot magazine every week, and it was the only thing that I ever, that I ever um, talked about, really. Uh, and so I, I was an Evertonian. Uh, it's a lifelong allegiance, actually, that I acquired by accident. My mum bought uh, a red mug and a blue mug when I was five, and I chose, <laughs> I chose the blue one. <laughs> and uh, you know that that's how these things, these things happen. So, um, but I wasn't. Uh, when I was seven, I, I wasn't actually allowed to go to a game, and my seven-year-old friend Andrew had been to a game, but I wasn't. It took two or three years of uh, of nagging actually to get my dad to take me to a game, and eventually, the, I think it's the day before my tenth birthday, I went to a game. Everton lost actually one nil to Liverpool, but um, you know, I was hooked. I was, I was there, and I was hooked. Um, but that same year when I was 10, uh, John Barnes, the England player, dribbled through the Brazilian defence in the Maracana Stadium in Brazil and scored one of the best goals uh, England have ever scored to win the game in Brazil, 2-0 for England. And the England fans chanted 1-0, 1-0, because the England fans who went to Brazil, very small group of them, they were mostly from the National Front. And their idea was that black players weren't English, that black goals didn't count. And so the score was 1-0, not 2-0. And that was the story of who could be English. Uh, and when I was, a few years later, John Barnes signed for Liverpool, not my team. And the Everton fans chanted, Everton are white, Everton are white, and chucked bananas at him, which he had to back heel off the pitch to get on with the game. The Everton fans, my fans, my team, the racists, that's what you call an identity crisis. So, um, but I was an Evertonian. I stayed as an Evertonian. It was my team. It wasn't only their team. But public racism 
was much, much more acceptable in the stadium than in the playground or on the bus or anywhere else. People who experience racism, you know, you have people might say something to you personally and you have an argument with them. This is the only place you would see crowds of people shouting racist slogans. You know, the most shocking slogans are Everton played Arsenal in a match and Arsenal had four black players, a very you know, low number actually now. Uh, and the, a large number of the fans were chanting, shoot that nigger, shoot that nigger as a crowd. That was the experience of going to football. When I was 10, and eventually, I mean, eventually I stayed and there were projects and in the places where this happened, you know, fans organised and dealt with it. And so, you know, I'm a parent now, I don't get to go to games, but I took three of my children to watch Everton lose the Women's FA Cup final just this Sunday. And you will never hear that again in a stadium. So football changed, our society changed, and that was, that was important. But what I want to argue is that football can't do it. Uh, can't do enough of it. Uh, I want to concede, I think, one big point uh, to David. I mean, David's book, The Ball is uh, Round, the most brilliant history of everything in the world, disguised as a history of, of football. It's all there, fascism, empire, colonialism, democracy. So you can get everything out of an engagement with football. So my, my heart is on that side of the argument. But here's why, here's why, it, here's, here's why it's not, here's why it's never enough. Um, we won the argument about who could be English in football. I can wear the shirt. England four, West Germany two, Yay. 1966. <laughs> it's 24 years. It's 24 years since Germany won the World Cup. It's 48 years <laughs> since England won it. That's that's a lot longer. Uh, <laughs> and I don't think it's going to change. So my heart's on that side of the argument. But here's the thing: we won the argument in the stadium. No one notices. No one doubts whether the black players are English. Uh, in, when we hosted Euro 96, actually, we had a celebratory culture in the stadium. The St. George's flag came out and we all owned it. But we still don't know. This is what surprises me. Another 20 years on, we still don't know if we've answered the question because we've won the argument in the stadium and we haven't won the argument in society entirely yet. We know that we can all be British. Who can be English? What does the St. George's flag do? If we don't do it outside the stadium as well as inside the stadium, actually, we get stuck. We still don't have the language, actually, of being black English. Asian English that we have of being British. So having multi-ethnic, talented football, rugby and cricket teams isn't enough because we haven't gone and shared a public national identity of being English outside the stadium. Uh, and another example of why it, why it wasn't enough, and I think this might be the toughest uh, point for David today in the debate, is that um, if this argument was going to be one that it could be won through football, and I think football does one thing better than anything else. Let me concede this one big point. It gives us a glimpse of a vision of a society we could share. There's a level playing field. You pick the right, you pick the players on talent. You know, you come through. It gives us that vision, but it doesn't help us deliver the vision. So if football was going to be the answer, the country that would have done this best would surely be France. Because in France, you had that moment of the vision in 1998, when they won the World Cup. It was tough to be a racist in France in 1998, that year. You said they won't sing the anthem. They didn't just sing the anthem, they sang the anthem and won the World Cup. And then they won the European Championship as well. And so you had a vision of the country that France could become. And so it was difficult to be a racist, but it wasn't so difficult that you couldn't vote Jean-Marie Le Pen into the final round of the presidency two years later. It wasn't so difficult that a generation on, you're not still seeing the National Front doing well. So what, what went wrong there? And actually, in the year they were world and European champions, the question was asked, are there too many players of foreign origin in the French team? And a third of the public, 36% of the public response said, yes, there are too many players when they'd won. So you can imagine how that felt when they'd lost. So what, what went wrong? I think the question is, what, what went wrong with the idea that football could be the answer was that there wasn't the follow through that you needed outside the stadium. If football is the answer, David, what's happened in France? Straight on then, David. Uh, you'll excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, if I stand up, but it just works better when I can move. So. Um, thank you very much for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, let me make some concessions, first of all, to the, uh, to the opposition. Clearly, football can't 
sort out racism by itself, but then nor can the nation states of the world or large corporate institutions or the entirety of civil society. The idea that one professional form of sport, one spectacular commercial entertainment might be the answer seems to be sociologically and politically ridiculous. So perhaps a better question to ask or one, an easier one for me to defend is to say, what is the potential of football? for dealing with racism, and is it actually living up to its potential? First, let me dispense with a couple of shibboleths or canards that I occasionally hear when having this kind of conversation, which is, of course, football can't sort the problem out. It's a game that's about conflict, and it's a game that's about winning, and it's a game that is instrumental. So how on earth do you propose to get mutual understanding out of such a situation? And I say to you, as a supporter mainly of Bristol Rovers, a team, you know, it's good to hear some laughs on Bristol Rovers. It's a team, for those of you who are not familiar with the geography of English football, it is a team that f has been at the bottom of the professional pile for a very, very long time. And this season was actually relegated to the wastelands of semi-professional football. And yet when that occurred, and in this season, which has been worse than all the others we've endured, 11,000 people came to the stadium and paid up their money to watch what can only be described as appallingly bad football. Clearly, something is going on other than winning. Indeed, the idea that it's all about winning is just a fiction that we collectively maintain to motivate professional sports people who we want to believe that. But the rest of us, we know it's not really about winning. Only one team can win in a season. The other 91 in England must necessarily lose, and yet the numbers keep coming. So what is going on? What actually is going on inside a football stadium? Uh, and I think if we understand that, we understand its enormous power, but its enormous potential, but also some of its limits. So I would say in England, but I think this is true of most footballing cultures, and for the Canadian contingent here who are not familiar necessarily with soccer cultures, think ice hockey when I'm talking about football. It does four things. In England, football is a ritual. It is a soap opera. It is a form of popular theatre. Uh, and it is increasingly a metaphor used by elites to describe the country. Um, let's just think about these a moment. In terms of ritual, uh, you can talk to me about the stats later, but pretty much the number of people attending professional football on a weekly basis in England is equivalent to attendance at the Church of England. Okay, if you throw the evangelicals, the Jews, the Muslims, and the Catholics in, then God is still a bigger draw. But, but then no one's watching the highlights of Mass on a Saturday night. Um, so just in terms of sheer numbers of people regularly gathering in the same place, going through the same collective performative actions, which they imbue, whatever you think they're doing, that they imbue with intense meaning, has the character of a ritual. Football, sometimes people say, is a religion, but clearly it's only superficially the same at the level of ritual. There is no supernatural force, however much we might wish to or explain away defeats in football but it becomes a collective ritual in which we collectively recognize ourselves. I mean, it is the case in Britain that there are no other occasions in which we regularly gather together in large numbers and reflect on ourselves. And it is certainly the case in England where traditions of local identity are weak, local civil society is weak, and local government is frankly hapless most of the time, that local civic and provincial identities are based around football. There are no other institutions that can claim the same purchase on the imagined community of locality, city, and nation the way English football clubs do. Secondly, football is a form of theatre. It's a narrative performance, albeit spontaneous, and the ending is not decided beforehand. But what distinguishes it from more conventional forms of theatre is that the audience is not passive. Indeed, the whole, pr the whole meaning of the occasion is created by the audience. You know, football matches mean nothing. Goals in the, you know, it's just the ball in the back of the net. Unless 80,000 people decide to invest that with meaning, to fit that moment into a longer narrative history of who they are, who their town is, who their club is. 
So that's extraordinary, and it's interesting to note the theatre industry occasionally puts out press releases in Britain where they say, oh, we managed to sell more tickets this year than, the, uh, than football. And you think, my God, they're comparing themselves to football. How times have changed that the theatre would actually see itself in the same realm. Of course, football is more than just one-off performances. It's multi-level performances, interacting and intersecting with each other in a variety of narrative stories across the season. And that, of course, is what soap operas are, where you have this enormous range of characters interacting with each other to produce multiple and unexpected storylines. And it's certainly the case in Britain that soap operas have functioned as a really important way of communicating and dealing with a variety of social issues. The particularly interesting thing for this audience, I hope, is that soap operas have been used in that way to reach a predominantly female audience, and that remains the case with soap operas. But if you want to talk to blokes, and if you want to talk to working class men, about difficult social issues and you're looking for a way in which to construct a narrative rather than merely lecturing them, football offers that opportunity through its peculiar form of masculine soap opera. Finally, it's used as a metaphor. I can't open a newspaper these days in Britain without finding someone saying, well, if you want to understand the limits of neoliberal economics, take a look at the premiership. Or if you want to understand some other feature of our society, take a look at the way in which football operates, and this goes both left and right. So you have an extraordinary device here for telling stories, making points that reaches parts of societies that most other forms of communication are simply not getting to. Why is this particularly good and particularly potent with relationship to racism? It seems to me there are two really important things about racism that need to be dealt with. One is the invisibility of racism. You know, actually most of the time racism is invisible. It's what's not said rather than what's said. It's what's said behind closed doors, all right? And most of the time people who are on the end of racism know exactly what it looks like and what exactly what it feels like. But actually much of the mainstream doesn't know and doesn't understand and doesn't have a way of beginning to understand or engage in a conversation about it. The second thing, that's really important in countering racism is that it strips people of their dignity and it doesn't treat them as equal human beings. And once again, football offers the opportunity for staking your place in a society. You know, fighting two, two racism minutes, is, David, okay, it's minutes. not just from above, it's from below. So let me just give you a couple of examples that illustrate why this is important and how football uh, can counter racism beyond merely just calming the racist epithets from the crowd. So one incident uh, that I think is important is John Terry, captain of England, racially abuses Anton Ferdinand, a black player, for QPR. And why this is as important, and if you'll excuse my language, John Terry says to him, you fucking black cunt. Now, I have heard that phrase a hundred times in Britain, and I've heard a hundred excuses for saying it. It's not racist. I'm just, I'm just cross with him. It's not a racial thing at all. And it becomes very, very, very clear the way in which it is said during the football match and the way in which the authorities have dealt with it subsequently that it is racist and this is not acceptable. And it's no good saying, oh, I didn't really mean it or it was just a joke or I was repeating words back. It makes it absolutely clear, unambiguously, to a core constituency that needs to understand that's the line. And we're not having conversations of that level of honesty in the public debate about what is racist, what is not, and what is acceptable. Second quick example, and then I will, uh, I will be silent. 25% um, uh, of players in, the, uh, in English football are black. They constitute the entire labor pool for um, becoming managers and coaches. For most seasons, for the last 10 years in England, less than 4%. Less than 4% of managers are actually black. And this season we started with four managers out of 92. We've ended up with zero. This seems to me an extraordinary demonstration, unambiguous of the way institutional racism works. It's a subject that we absolutely need to communicate to everybody that the way in which racism operates is a structural phenomena as well as about personal disposition. But that is a conversation that almost nobody in Britain wants to have 
and I say this as a partner of someone who was the uh, head of diversity for a large accountancy company where we talk about these things over the breakfast table. No one else is interested. You put it on the pages of the sports press and suddenly this question becomes relevant, comprehensible and important. And until you're having that kind of conversation with the mainstream, we're not going anywhere. Football offers that opportunity. Last thought. The struggle against racism takes many, many forms and it requires many, many, many qualities. It requires guile, wit, heart and bravery. And football delivers those in spades. And it strikes me rather as uh, that old Victorian gentleman, Karl Marx, said of capitalism, so too with football. It contains the seeds of its own solution rather than just its problems. Thank you, David. Um, we're going to... Can I have some sound? Yeah, thanks. Thank you, David. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested that you... Do you think there's a difference between professional football and appallingly bad football? Is one more likely to be a good challenge? I think you have to come to Bristol Rovers and experience okay. this. It's, it's, a, it's a date. OK, I'm, I'm coming, um, coming straight back for... Um, Sunder's uh, comments in response to David and then doing the reverse and then we're going to have a couple of questions by video link and then we're going to have time for a conversation in the room. I think the debate really about racism has to be about what kind of anti-racism projects do we need today for the future. I think football did a lot uh, over recent decades but I think I think we need different projects in the future and some of the anti-racism football initiatives I think that we've got have got a bit tired and need to move on. Any social movement, the glass is always going to be half full and half empty and you get to decide what stories to tell about how you're doing. But I think anti-racist movements have been too slow to claim victories and advances because we always, of course, want to be vigilant about it, but we're not very good actually at singing when we're winning, and the enormous generational shift against racism is something we should claim and unlock the future. But if you're going to unlock that future, you need to move on because the challenges change because of your successes and because of your failures too. So I'm a bit skeptical about the type of uh, anti-racism strategies that we now see, particularly from the Premier League and FIFA and UEFA. There's a sort of celebratory corporate box kind of anti-racism that mostly turned up after the arguments were won to say that they were won. And when arguments haven't been won, you know, homophobia is actually a, you know, a prevalent thing. They'll probably put the campaigns in place once it's been dealt with rather than when we, when, when we, when we, when we need it. So um, the awareness raising, you know, the banners, the T-shirts. I mean, we had the example in, in Britain of players wear a T-shirt, uh, you know, to say kick racism out. And finally it was news because some people said, we're not going to wear it this year. And not wearing the T-shirt was news in a way that wearing the T-shirt never is now. Because actually, I'd, I'd love to see some proper research into who's even hearing that message of a banner and a statement and an armband. And so I think, I think if football wants to do something now, it should do something more difficult. Then, you know, of course, we should complete the job of getting rid of overt racism where it still exists, but we should do something more difficult. Anti-Muslim prejudice is, is, you know, a really big form of prejudice and racism in our cities, in our countries and so on. Footballers should get out and talk about the issue that's difficult, not just say, well, we're all against racism now. Uh, and also we should move on. I think this is a cities of migration kind of point. We should move on from, uh, you know, the absence of overt racism to really taking seriously the challenge of clubs being a site of integration. And that would involve football clubs local government, cities, other players, saying the stadiums the team plays in that represents the city, the stadiums should look like the city. And over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, we're actually going to work to make the stadiums look like the city so that football actually becomes a site of integration because that would be something difficult and new to do, 
rather than just wearing the T-shirt. So I think we should move on. And, you know, big and small clubs should do that. I mean, David talks about the way in which having the conversation about football can be, can be the solution, and that's good. But my worry about that is what happens if football remains the exception and it becomes a sort of exceptional sphere and we don't translate the lessons across? Think about the double life of the way we talk about immigration. There are stories of hero worship of immigration every day in our tabloid popular newspapers. They're on the back pages, the footballer migrants. They're not on the front pages, but because immigrant and immigrant anxiety is about the foreigner we don't know, the familiar hero migrants don't become migrants at all, so we're not making the link. Think about the World Cup. I was doing a bit of uh, original research on the plane over using a World Soccer Magazine's World Cup guide. The World Cup tells us stories about the power of national identity uh, and so on, but it tells us stories that we're going to miss, actually, because we don't make the link in the, in the double life. There are going to be nearly 750 footballers playing in the World Cup for the 32 countries. Are we going to notice that most of them are migrants? Two-thirds of the footballers in the World Cup play outside their country of origin, play outside the country that they represent. Only Russia has picked a team of 23 players based in Russia, and they've got, a, they've got an Italian coach, though. <laughs> and so we see, different, we see different stories of immigration, integration, but we see it as a two-way street. So these are skilled migrants who went to pursue uh, their opportunities in life to contribute somewhere else to retain their pride. But will we... Will, will, will we notice that story? You see the story of um, Bosnia and its diaspora community. And so the German-born Bosnians who will represent Bosnia and be represented in Bosnia. In England, you see the story that we don't even notice anymore that the players have migrant heritage because that's, uh, that's, we're, so used to, we're so used to doing that. But we'll also Can see... Can you draw to a close? Yeah, we'll see uh, 90, 90 or 100 players who play in England, representing other countries, but I think we won't, draw those, um, we won't drill those messages out. Which countries have benefited most from immigration in the World Cup? Maybe Belgium is a great team, but also world soccer. Switzerland. Kitzfeld relies on non-Swiss talent. Players from immigrant families form the backbone of the side. Switzerland will cheer for a team that depends on immigration, but Switzerland can hold the referendum and say no to immigration. If it's going to do the work, we'll have to make the link. Thank you. Thank you, Sunda. <laughs> There's several challenges in there we'll return to, but your turn, David. Uh, firstly, to say, I mean, of course, you're right in the case of England, and we're in danger of being rather Anglo-centric here, that the issue of over racism in the stadium is by and large, let's, we mustn't be complacent, but it's by and large and reflects a wider change in uh, English society. This is clearly not true of many, many other places around the world. I mean, this is just the beginning. So if we were having this conversation about the Ukraine, for example, or Poland, or actually a hundred different places. So it seems to me because we've made um, progress in one place, a more cosmopolitan outlook sees that this is just the beginning. Secondly, to say, I think that um, you're quite right to say, yes, we need to take on the other bits of racism in the football industry. Uh, but once again, I think this is, as I was saying earlier, this is really good. Clearly, it wasn't just enough to stop people chanting racism in the stadiums because you've got you know, the media institutions, the coaching institutions, the boards, the directorships, the staffing of every football club in its kind of both its demographic makeup, but also in its kind of uh, norms and assumptions about who is a football person. A, a, a phrase regularly used and one that kind of hides a whole series of assumptions about race and gender and sexuality were not taken on. And we're now actually, I think in some ways, this is, this is the next challenge uh, and in some ways more difficult um, because it, again, it's hidden. We're now back to institutions. When you've got people screaming stuff in a stadium, you know, it looks ugly, it sounds ugly, you can make a case against it. But that kind of hidden, insidious racism that operates inside most institutions, so much harder to get at, and football 
provides that opportunity. I think I must come back to the France question. I mean, I think it's a really good point. You know, if, if, if it really worked in a simplistic sense, quite rightly, France should be free of racism. Uh, as you say, not only the most extraordinary mixed team, but an incredible victory. You know, Zidane's face um, being uh, beamed on the side of the Arc de Triomphe, which seems to me an extraordinary reflection on the meaning of French empire in, uh, in the 20th century. Um, it seems to be one failure doesn't write the whole project off. Uh, and clearly, we would be naive to think that, you know, good news coming from football in whatever its forms in the absence of either uh, a serious, you know, a society-wide push is not going to make the change. And I think what we need here, and I think, you're, again, you're right to say UEFA, FIFA, the football associations, they love to be associated with this. They love to put up the banners. But when it comes to doing the really hard, serious work of dealing with that at an institutional level, of taking on vested interests, of saying uncomfortable things, we haven't had that. And until you have football administrators uh, and people across the football industry really taking that agenda on, no, we won't be delivering on our promise. Um, but what I return to in my defense is, if you're not going to go to football, where are you going to go? Because I don't see that any other sport or any other cultural phenomena in Europe and Latin America, or any, at any rate, it comes anywhere close in reaching the scale of audience and the type of audience that anti-racism campaigns need to, um, need to get to. So imperfect, flawed, occasionally hypocritical, yes. But football, it seems to me, in Europe and Latin America remains an indispensable component of any meaningful anti-racist strategy. Right, thank you very much, both, both of you. Um, we've now got um, a couple of questions fr from Canada by, by video link. So can we, Hi. Can we see those? Hi, my names? name is Iggy Egal, and I'm the program manager for the Toronto Inner City Rugby Foundation. We work in Toronto to build community through rugby and rugby through community by reducing financial, geographic and cultural barriers to playing the game. While I work in rugby, I had my start in soccer where I played, coached and refereed for many years. And it was in my years as a referee that I experienced racism quite a lot. Players would hurl racial slurs at me and of course you deal with it as the game requires, as the law requires a red card and a dismissal, the player faces a disciplinary commission, and they're suspended maybe one, two, or even three games. A few weeks down the line, however, you'd see the same player back on the pitch, and you'd wonder, have they ever thought twice about what they've done or said? Racism in sport is more than just about punishing the offenders and the racists. It's about changing individual people. In your opinion, what would you say is the one thing that can be done to change individuals. That, that, is, that is a very good question, and you used the word reflection, and I was surprised when you did earlier on that uh, football's a theater, a dramatic performance, and, and people reflect on it. Um, so so, so we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll bear that in mind. I think we, we have a second a second. Hi, my name is Nakio Sute. I'm with the organizing committee for the Pan Am and the Para Pan Am Games coming to Toronto in 2015. Brazilian authorities have said they want to use the World Cup to heighten awareness around the issue of racism. If it's a spectator issue, how could an international mega event like the World Cup or the Pan Am Games help to set the tone? What can these events aspire to do? Thank you. Okay, so those are two, two questions that have been uh, beamed in from from Canada, and do I, I would, would like both of you to give a very brief answer to those questions, and then we still have a reasonable amount of time for some both some questions and some comments, and also if I could ask people to be thinking about lining up um, good practice examples because that at the end of the day that is what we are actually here at this conference to do, which is to virally spread uh, good news. Sunda. I think the, the sort of behaviour change question is a really good question and in a way um, 
it's a challenge, I think, almost to the other question about setting the tone. Because this is, this is what I think doesn't work now about the celebratory, we're all against racism now. Firstly, I don't know if anyone's even hearing the message. It's become, so it's, it's, like, the, it's like the sort of flight safety instructions if you're a frequent flyer, when they're doing that in the stadium. You just, you filtered it out. I don't think anyone's hearing it. And it's not doing what we actually need to do. Having sort of established a sort of majority norm, if you get to that point, we now need to have difficult conversations about why it's difficult. There's nothing to talk about actually in the we're all against racism, well done everybody conversation. And so it doesn't actually get to the sort of behavioral change, structural change kind of discussion that you want to, that you want to unlock. So that, that, I think that's an example of how, how you need to sort of move on to the next challenge. Um, with regard to Brazil 2014 and the issue of um, what do the stadiums look like, they say these days in Brazil that watching Brazil is watching like watching Sweden because it's full of people in yellow and blue shirts with white skins and bleach blonde hair. Uh, and I can tell you from my own experience of seeing Brazil in, Braz in Brazil, it's pretty much 99% white. And there's a very, very simple reason for that, that class and race are very closely aligned in Brazil, and the tickets to go to the football are incredibly expensive, even if you're middle class. So the singularly most important thing, if you want to watch like, the, the World Cup, to look like the country that it's from is think about what your ticket prices are and how they're distributed because they're simply beyond the reach of most poor Brazilians. Um, in answer to the other question, I mean, really, you know, it's like you were talking about individuals, so there's no one thing that works. I mean, it's such a contextual thing. I mean, I slightly go with my um, father, who was a sort of archetypal tough Jew, who would have said, well, depends on the person, but sometimes you have to kind of punch them in the face, and that teaches them a lesson. <laughs> and I am actually not entirely against that. That's sometimes actually what racists need is a good slap, and I'm sorry about that. But that, and in certain worlds, that actually is the way it works. Uh, I don't generally approve, but that is part of the equation. I mean, if there was one thing that could happen in football that would really make a difference is that when someone was abused racially amongst the players, either by the crowd or by another player, the entire team needs to walk off there and then. And you don't wait for the referee either. And they do now actually have permission to do that. It's happened once in Italy. Kevin Prince Botang uh, at Milan walked off. We need to see that. I want to see that in the middle of a really, really important international game or a really important cup game where a lot of money's riding on it. And I want to see them walk off if it happens. And that will make, you know, that will begin a process of change. Very good idea. Okay. Um, the, these guys uh, will, will be summing up um, in, a, in a few minutes, but first, there's an opportunity for a round of uh, both questions, but also comments, and also uh, uh, sharing, of, uh, sharing of good integration practice uh, where you know of it. Okay, I'm going to take two or three in the first instance. I've got... I, well, I have to take Ratna first if your hand is up. Yeah, Rot, it's a joke. And uh, and Don, um, third hand. Somebody whose watch is up in the air who I can't see. Yes, that's you. Yeah, you can you, you as well, please. Mm. But you might have to stand because I can only see your watch. Um, okay, Ratna, can we have a mic up here? It's fine, it's fine. Can we have a mic up here? So let's cross the ocean over to our side of the ocean. Something very interesting happened there. The National Basketball Association, Donald Sterling, and the heavy, heavy punishment that was meted out to the owner of the team. I'm not a sports fan, so I'm not quite sure what the name of the team is. Someone will have to help me out here. <laughs> but I do know the result. He was punished. He lost ownership of the team. Uh, of a team that he apparently loved because of the racist statements he made. Could something like that happen in the UK in this instance? If a coach makes a racist statement or a player makes a racist statement, they're actually expelled from the franchise. Sometimes carrots work and sometimes sticks. Yes okay. and no is the answer to that. Shall I answer yes, this on, yes, very okay. briefly? Uh, no in terms of owners because um, it's a different system. 
So you don't have a situation where you don't have an NBA commissioner or an NFL commissioner who can really set the rules. Um, the Premier League doesn't work like it doesn't work like that. So that option is not available. They might be able to be forced out because it became politically embarrassing. But the actual use of some sort of administrative measure to stop someone owning a club, no. I mean, if you look at who's owning the clubs in Britain, you'll see we really will take anyone. Uh, and it's impossible to get rid of them. It's a migrant sport. Um, on the... Um, sorry, the other point, uh, on players and so on. Uh, I mean, a good example of this is, you know, Ron Atkinson, who was a kind of national treasure, uh, coach, manager and pundit, um, said a lot of really racist things off mic. And um, his career was destroyed. He's over. He'll never be on television again. And I think we, are certainly in the media at any way, we've reached the point you can't survive after saying something, something like that. But as an owner, the system of ownership is such that they can't be touched. Um, thanks for that, David, clarification. Yeah, Next one. There, there needs to be a correction about this, about the, the entire discussion of the Clippers. The, he got paid $2 billion for that team. Okay, four times more than any other NBA team had ever been purchased for is what the deal is on the table. So in terms of levels of punishment, it's, it's it, it very easy to exaggerate uh, his suffering. Okay, it, it wasn't a punch in the face then in the same, perhaps the same way as da David. Um, there's a lot of money in this sport, isn't there? I know that's a different sport. Um, can I go to the next questioner yeah. or commenter? Okay, is this working? Yeah. Um, yes, I suspect we're in the last 70 minutes and Sunder probably appreciates that he's 2-0 down at the, at the moment. But anyway, you might be used to that, being an Evans supporter. Um, I, I'm, I'm a bit surprised that both speakers have, have, have emphasised that it, football is unique in, uh, in this particular role as being a symbol of something that can generate this level of imagery and you know, hold out the prospect of a, of a, of a post-racialist, non-racist future. Um, I, one of the few things about being in your 60s is that you can say that you spent your teenage years in the, 19, the 1960s, which is the greatest decade for anybody to live in. Um, but music played this function for me. As a white working class kid growing up in a northern town, never meeting black people, I can tell you my first teenage crush was on Otis Redding. I, I love this guy. I wanted to be his best friend. Um, in terms of activities on Saturday, large crowds of people co congregating together, doing things in common. That was Liverpool and Manchester and Wigan on a Saturday night. Um, and it was driven by this image of black American soul music suddenly presenting itself on the, the world stage and informing and educating a generation of people. It had political implications when Enoch Powell in 68 made his Rivers of Blood speech. There was a whole group of us that looked at each other and said, why wouldn't we want to have black people living down our streets? They're great. You know, it's, we, the, our problem was that, our, that, that that wasn't happening. Years later, rock against racism suddenly exploded on the scene. The last mass mobilization of, of anti-racist sentiment on the streets of the UK. So what I'm saying, I, I suspect that these things are not unique, and I'll finish on this, and that there are actually more resources that we can draw on in order to make these points. I'm going I'm to risk scoring, a, scoring an own goal here and making it 3-0. I think music, music still does that um, in, an, in an organic way and definitely had that historic role, but it's actually got a lot harder to do that through music, culture, and so on, because music has fragmented in a way that wasn't true in the 60s and 70s, where there's a chart that everyone listened to. And so the speed of change, so you don't any longer have 20 million or 25 million people in a large country doing the same thing at the same time in music as you would have had with the traditional kind of pop chart. So it's definitely having that big impact on the generational change and the generational shift, but it's, it's much harder to have an entire national conversation about it for two hours one night. And just that, I mean, I completely agree with it's, it's an enormous resource. And if you substituted the word reggae rather than soul, I mean, there's my youth and my trajectories, <laughs> not, 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 entire, not entirely different. And the conclusions that I reached were not, in, were not entirely different. I think 
part of it is, um, you know, football offers the po possibility of abstract representation of community in a way that uh, music doesn't. In the end, music is about, you know, great individuals and stars and bands that come and go. But they don't seem to me have the sort of enduring cultural capital of a national side, a club team representing it, that sort of representative quality. You know, what Eric Osborne says is, you know, just somehow it's easier to get into the imagined community when it's 11, it's 11 people on a, on a team, on a pitch. That is, um, it's much easier to make that kind of, what is actually a really big conceptual leap to think about community and your place in it through football. I mean, this is not to in any way denigrate you know, what music can and the possibilities of it. Clearly, it has all the sort of universalism and participative possibilities and, you know, moments of ecstasy and understanding as well. Um, but I just think in that representational way, football offers something peculiarly powerful. I mean, other sports do, of course, but, you know, the reality is is that football is, is by a very, very long way the most popular sport pretty much everywhere now. And, and I would say if, I, I, as well that going back to your soap opera point, in comparison to music, it's a really frequent engagement with that same theatre of characters every week, twice a week, most of the year. Yeah, every single day, every single minute now that Twitter has arrived. <laughs> okay, well, that's a... Uh, 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 there's someone at the back that had her hand... Yes. W were you the lady with the watch? Well, okay, sure. it's your turn, really. <laughs> Uh, just um, one thing that occurred to me, a uh, kind of best can practice. You, can you Sorry, can you tell us where you're from? Ah, okay. Uh, well, I'm from Toronto, uh, okay. but I'm actually kind of based in Heidelberg right now, at uh, the University of Heidelberg. Uh, so one point that occurred to me within the context of this uh, debate is that in, in Germany there is an initiative called Show Racism the Red Card, and they do exactly this, I mean, using football and using uh, stadiums around the country as a space to uh, bring uh, different classes, like school, school groups from different schools around Germany to come and kind of discuss uh, issues around racism and discrimination, and they also try to engage uh, professional soccer players to come and to role play different circumstances on the field with the students. And so this is a nationwide initiative that maybe could be looked at as a best practice as well. Okay, thanks very much for that. We, we had in the UK um, kick racism out of football dash show racism re the red card um, for, for, for quite a long time. And it, and it came actually on the back of rock against racism, uh, I think, really. Um, so, Sundar, what's your do? Do you, what, what? What? What do you think about the, that campaign? Has that run its course in the UK? Is that really what you were saying, I or can it be still made useful? I think. I think. I think. As I say, the kind of just the symbolic, like everyone mouth the slogan stuff. I think you get to a certain point that's run its course. I think there are two things it can do. It can look at structural issues within the game which it increasingly tries to do, and then it's difficult to get the oxygen. But as I say, I think the challenge is, if the power is of the metaphor, then the metaphor has to be seen to apply to things that aren't sports. So the thing that worries me is that actually, you know, it's great to have tabloid newspapers that know they're against racism if someone's racist, and then, you know, argue strongly about it. But if we only talk about sport and football, which is actually the area where we made a lot of progress, then we don't get to use the metaphor to apply to other things. So I think if we're going to do it, it's very powerful, I think, to use it as a metaphor beyond the stadium, not just about the structural issues in the game. OK, thanks. And obviously what's going on uh, here, in, here in Germany are practical, actual initiatives uh, using that, s not just using that slogan, but uh, developing new methodologies. So thanks very much for sharing that. Um, we've got time for another, another quick round, if people can keep their remarks short. Uh, lady over on the right here, Uli in the front here, and gentleman with uh, with the bracelet on. Yeah? I, I can't see very well at the back. Sorry, my eyesight's not so great. But over here first. Hi, um, I'm Cully, and I uh, head up race, faces, and cohesion research at Ipsos Mori. I'll be speaking tomorrow. A point to David and a point to Sunder. Um, talking about, um, you know, ticket prices being out of reach in Brazil, I think it's actually very much the case in the premiership in the UK. And, you know, that the stands don't look like, you know, the population they serve. I think a case in point is, I think it's Wolves have a very, very strong, I think, Sikh um, 
fan base, but they have set up their own fan base because they don't feel they can be part of the mainstream fan base. And I think another point in terms of where there's actually been good, more recent things happening in terms of integration, I think it was Luton um, recently got a whole load of Muslim women in traditional outfits to come and attend a match and experience what a football match is actually like because they've never been to one before. I think it's just too quick. I, I bet that was interesting on both <laughs> sides. I'm actually going to bring Artin Lazari from, Wol he's from Wolverhampton here into, if you don't mind, Artin, um, can, can you... Can you comment on that, over what's going on in Wolverhampton? Well, the reason why I raised my hand earlier uh, had a little to do with Wolverhampton, but I will answer what you just asked. Uh, Wolverhampton Wanderers is, is very lucky in the sense that for being the football club of a town that is literally struggling economically for many years now, has got a very loyal fan base because to prove David's point, uh, the emotions go back in history, they used to be a lot better, and people might be uh, living 30 miles away, and children who had very little contact with Wolverhampton now are still Wolves fan because their granddad was a Wolves fan. From that point of view, uh, I would like them to worry a bit more about the fact that in the future, in a town that is changing drastically now, that fan base will reduce if they don't focus more on the uh, new arrival communities. Is there any chance I can comment a bit on what I wish to comment earlier? Very briefly, then. Uh, I'll Bri briefly, yes, please. I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, I voted pro David's side, and I'm not going to change the mind after the debate because, as a Southern European, I know that it's one thing to follow Don's point to drool over Beyonce on stage when he dances. She dances. And another thing is to be faced as an Italian, for example, with the fact that Mario Balotelli is being considered an Italian, but still a few thousand people uh, in the stadium will chant, non ci sono italiani neri, there are no black Italians. And I cannot think in Italy, in Greece, in Spain, in the Balkans where I come from, of another medium that can bring the ugliness of the societies in the surface like football does. And if that lad that was crying there in the screen for his sins, and I really feel for him, has the power only by being black in a football field to show the Italian society how, how ugly a big part of it is, then I cannot think of another medium at the moment who can do that. That's why you lose the debates on that. <laughs> I, I don't think we'll have the summation just yet, Artin. Um, uh, Uli. I think we, we haven't explored so much the, the positive aspects of football and um, we touched upon it when you mentioned France. Um, you know, I think there's a real nation building potential in football and we can clearly see that in Germany. The fact that uh, the best German current player is from Turkish background is tremendously important um, for example um, in, in terms of a role model for kids from tur Turkish descent in, in German football clubs. I see that in the team of my son, you know, he's playing with many um, um, guys from German, um, from Turkish uh, um, background, and, and it's very important that Mesut Özil is, you know, the man of the German soccer team. I don't know what the end of that story, and France is obviously telling that there is no, nece not necessarily a happy end to that, but I think we should really dwell a little bit uh, upon the the nation-building potential of football. I think it, it's clearly there, and and of course, for example, all our politicians, when Mesut Özil was, uh, Mesut Özil was nominated, the um, for the for the national team, the integration commissioner came up and gave him, you know, um, they, not a prize, but uh, they see that there is such a potential, and I think we should really uh, dwell a little bit, a little bit upon that. Do either of you want to comment on that, or shall we just shall we move on? You have s no, 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 no. Okay, um, uh, gentleman at the back. Yeah, have, have you got a microphone back there yet? Thank you very much. Uh, hello. Um, if it's all right, I'd like to continue to talk about the negative aspect. Can you tell us where you're from as well? All right. My name is Gamit Singh. I'm from Birmingham in England, but uh, I live here in Berlin. Um, so I just want to focus more on the negative aspects of football again, if that's okay. But um, I was just thinking, if football is a kind of uh, focus or crucible, for different kinds of identity, 
what do you do when part of that identity involves racism? You know, there are many instances uh, in English football at least, where being, say for example, a fan of Millwall, a fan of West Ham or something like that, involves being racist. You express your loyalty to Millwall, your identity as a Millwall fan, by being racist, sexist, homophobic, all the rest of it. So it seems to me that the question in the debate, uh, sorry, the motion here is in a sense, uh, at least in some instances, tautological because how do you end racism without, in those instances, ending football? Cancelling Millwall Football Club, let not, let, not letting West Ham fans go to games, telling Tottenham fans who, you know, say we are yids and stuff like this, what, do you, what, what the hell do you do about that, essentially? And I just don't think that's really been addressed. So. I, I have an answer to that, but um, can, I, can I bring I you in, Sundar? I think there are examples, and you certainly saw it with the use of football crowds to promote Serbian nationalism. You see it, I think, in a quite institutionalized way in terms of Italian ultras, where the belonging really is to a group where the values are, are anti-inclusive. Uh, and so it's incredibly important, I think, to challenge that and to root that out. The answer isn't to say we don't need tribes and identities, because actually we do need tribes and identities, but the test is whether the tribes can be inclusive or not. I mean, in some of the cases that you gave from England, in the, in the clubs with the most problems, actually quite a lot of grassroots work has been done, but actually also the image is always there. And so any instance will, will put the image, and of course the image itself will have driven out some people that, that will be against it, but it's absolutely a site where there needs to be a, a counter challenge. But if there's an institutionalized thing like the sort of Italian ultras with the connivance actually of the club, authorities, you know, actually being supported and rewarded actually for that form of identity. I mean, that, that needs to be challenged much more strongly as, as governance actually, where that, that is disbanded in a very active way. You know, you're not gonna end the club, but those supporters shouldn't sit together and have a block where they get to sing and shout, you know, what they want to share. My, my sons um, uh, grew up in a part of inner London where Millwall would naturally have been their club, but the part that they lived in was very uh, multiracial. They were in multiracial schools all their school careers. And they went on the kick racism out of football, Millwall community events, but they supported Arsenal. And I think that's one of the, one of the things that happens is that people divide their tribes not by who they would naturally support, but by the ideology they would naturally uh, fall into. But Perhaps I'm being too parochial. David. I'm going to respond to it partly by not dwelling on negativity, but coming back to the positive side. And I think that is part of the argument. And say, again, music can do this, but football is particularly good at moments of collective ecstasy. And if fighting racism, yeah, I mean, it's a kind of painstaking, bureaucratic process but it's got to have a kind of emotional moment. And we're always talking in these kind of forums about visions. And it's like, okay, so like really actually, what is the vision? Describe it, make that tangible. And I just want you to think for a moment about um, Brazil winning the World Cup in 1958. And to think about cosmopolitanism, which is a concept we all think about, but it's quite hard to pin down what does it really look like. And when Brazil won that World Cup, um, by beating the host Swedens in the final. If you watch them play, the Swedes are so in love with the Brazilians by the end of it. When their own players fall over, they start laughing. And when the Brazilians out-dribble their own players, they actually start cheering. And then this is reciprocated in the most extraordinary way. Um, when Brazil win and they get the trophy, they celebrate by running round the stadium with a gigantic Swedish flag. I mean... Can you imagine, this is almost inconceivable in contemporary football, but what an extraordinary moment that you win the World Cup, but then you take the defeated host's flag around the stadium. And this is the moment, of course, where everybody falls in love with multi-ethnic Brazil and sees it for the first time in that way. And I think that's a very special power, to have moments of collective ecstasy that can be infused with those kinds of meanings. I'm really not sure where else one can find them, but I do know that we need them. Right, I'm going to move to, um, to the closure. You each have um, uh, a couple of minutes. 
or one one sentence would do if the, if that would sum it all up for you. You can have a couple of minutes, Sunda. A uh, couple of minutes because uh, then after that we're going to close up, and Kim is going to come back up um, and talk about the results and see what the overall result um, uh, uh, whether whether any of you have changed your mind, Sunda. Well, because I, I need several goals in injury time is what I'm being told here. So let's, uh, let's, let's have a go. Of course, sport gives us powerful, symbolic success stories that we should use. The danger of those success stories is that even positive stereotypes can pigeonhole if you're not careful. So yes, samosas, steel bands, uh, sport, they all had their place, but we should also be testing whether or not, so whether or not we're doing enough to go beyond it. So I actually want to pr just propose very quickly three ways to raise the bar, actually, to ask the question, if we're using the metaphor, actually, should we earn the right to use the metaphor. Here are three tests of whether you've earned the right to use the metaphor. Cities of migration filled identity gaps in Turin, in Manchester, in Barcelona, in Madrid, you know, 100 years ago. And we need our football clubs to do that again. But if you're going to celebrate the diversity on the pitch, then maybe the stands aren't going to look as diverse as the pitch. They have to start to look like the cities and towns they represent. If you're not seeing where that's happening and making progress towards that, at a local level, you haven't earned the right to use the metaphor. At the national level, you're going to count the goals that Balotelli scores for Italy. And then we need to say, okay, so the, the young lad in the classroom, the young woman in a headscarf, does that make her just as English, just as French, just as Swiss, just as Italian, just as Austrian? If you're cheering for the goals, if you're counting the goals of the centre forward, but as an exception, but not accepting that you're sharing your national identity, you haven't earned the right to use the metaphor. And finally, compare the footballers that European countries will send to the World Cup with the 700 MP, MEPs we've just sent to the European Parliament. So if you're, let's see some change. Now, the football teams are younger and the, the minority populations are pretty young. So maybe it will start to take time to come through. But actually, in Britain, we've got to this really remarkable breakthrough moment that was mentioned by Doug Saunders, where the educational gap has closed. What a great opportunity because of the educational success we saw in the last 10 or 15 years. The success rates of girls from Pakistani and Bangladeshi backgrounds, you know, we'll still look at who's left behind. If you don't then see that coming through powerfully as economic opportunity right at the top of our society, then there's going to be a frustration there right at the top. So the black football manager matters, but so does the judge, the newspaper editor, you know, the person who makes it all that matters more. So actually, if you're going to celebrate the German football team, as you should, as your first 11, as your squad of 22. Are you planning to make your cabinet, your first 11, your first 22, look as diverse as Germany, as well as your football team? Because if you do that, then you'll have earned the right to use the metaphor. So let's use the metaphor of sport, but use it actually to test our ability to bring about change in society. Thanks. Okay. Uh, okay, Sunda, you've had your last word. We'll see in a few minutes whether you've done enough. David, um, one more. Sunda's, uh, what Sunda just said demonstrates the sine qua non, the necessary condition of football delivering on its promise is that it needs stern critics. And that's one of the things, actually, that it, ha that it has lacked traditionally. And so exactly the kind of bar raising, exactly this kind of criticisms that Sunder is making is exactly what the, uh, the English football establishment... I mean, to be fair, if we were having a conversation about, I don't know, the Ukraine or Greece, we might be, we might be pitching the bar slightly lower because you've got to, you know, walk before you can run. Um, and I take, you know, I, I would say the football world should welcome those challenges because it is in a unique position to lead the way. I mean, clearly, you know, in the end, what our football team looks like is less important than the caliber of uh, and the character of the MEPs that we're sending to the European Parliament. But we have to start somewhere. We have an extraordinary resource available to us. I'm pleased to say we have some stern and wise critics as well. And I think that combination will actually allow football to deliver on at least some of its promise. Thank you, David. Uh, now I'm going to ask Kim to come up and take over here um, to announce to... 
Yeah, yeah, hey, hey sorry. Hey. That's great. I want to thank, um, I want to thank you, Sarah. I want to thank our, our duelists, our competitors, our debaters this evening. Um, good sports, all of you. Uh, let's have a hand first for, for Sundar Kadvala and David Goldblatt. <laughs> yeah. And a, ver and a very special thank you to you, Sara, uh, for a su superb play on the Cities of Migration field. Um, but, but in <laughs> fact, thank you very much. We're actually not quite done with you. What we did is we asked you to vote on the motion. Be it resolved, professional football is powerless to end racism. And you voted on your way in. You also told us whether you were open to be swayed by the argument. And 66% of you said you were open to be swayed uh, by the argument. So we're going to ask you to vote again now. All of you will find one of these. Uh, one of these forms on your chair. You have an opportunity to vote. We have all our volunteers at the back of the room. They're collecting your, your ballots. Wear your sticker. Did you vote? Yes, no. Put it on your sleeve. And uh, what we'll do is we'll announce the results once they've been tabulated um, in about 15 minutes. But now what I invite you all to do is to, to make merry, to, to go back into the room forget to thank David Goldblatt? How did I do that? I'm sorry. <laughs> Anyways, th thank you, everybody. Thank you, David. Thank you, Sundar. And, uh, and I invite you all to join us for a beautiful reception put on by the Heinrich Bull Stiftung. And we'll be back to announce the results of the great debate. Be it resolved, professional football is powerless to end racism. Uh, David Goldblatt was for the motion, and Sundar Katvala was against. Yeah, let us know what you think. Thank you very much, all.